Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 83 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we're going to discuss use what you brought, but don't bring all you can. And I think that is a really important concept when it comes to learning how to shoot in the field. And then to further go on to this, we want to talk about the old saying is ounces equal pounds, pounds equal pain. But I want to tell you, I think two pounds taken out of your pack and put it into your rifle can make a world of difference, not only on your shooting and shooting fundamentals, but your ability to follow up and self-spot. So lots to talk about in this podcast, but without further ado, here we go. All right, so first I'd like to say thank you to Krieger Barrels. Krieger is another fine sponsor of the show, making fine cut rifle barrels. They also have their new Krieger Direct where you can log on and purchase readily made available barrels that you can have in little as two to three business days. So if you want a barrel and you need it now, stop over to KriegerDirect.com. We'd also like to thank Trigger Tech. Trigger Tech is also a proud sponsor of the show. It is what we use here at our school. It is what we have in our showroom and a great product for a great price. So we think they're world-class triggers, and we use them strictly and solely here. And so if you'd like to pick out a great trigger for your aftermarket or factory rifle, stop over to TriggerTech.com today. All right, so we just finished up one of our long-range shooting schools, and this was a private class. So we had four individuals uh, that work for the government come through and take a course with us. We're really excited to have them here. What a great group of guys. What a fantastic time to be on the range with them. And on day three, we got to go over some advanced subjects and uh, additional shooting positions and things and how to train and what you would see in the field, like a traditional hunting type scenario, stuff like that. And I think I surprised them a little bit when, you know, they were we were talking about this training. I brought my backpack. I bought two small rear bags. Of course, I brought the typical things that I would take on a big game hunting trip, which include a spotting scope, tripod, a set of shooting sticks, and then that is it. And I think I shocked them a little bit on what little gear I use. Oh, and by the way, let's not forget about a little trick I learned years and years ago on how to shoot off of a side of a tree using two type pack slings uh, that tighten, or I guess you would almost consider them like cinch down straps to tighten everything down on your pack so they got a little plastic double loop through on one end and it's just about maybe an inch wide and two feet long something like that and you can sort of slip the loop through one end and pull it tight making a loop and then you can flip the other one through and make another loop so very small something i would keep on my pack the tighten down let's just say we're packing out an elk or something we need to snug everything up on our pack but other than that that was it And I laid up a lot of scenarios just with these very simple tools on, you know, how shooting off of elevation and angle is really what you're trying to accomplish when you're learning to shoot from these different positions. And it really is about taking advantage of the equipment that you have rather than bringing everything that you can. And the fundamentals of marksmanship can be applied and you can make some fantastic shots just with typically taking what you would take from a hunting trip and using it in every way, shape, and form that you can think about getting the best out of it. I mean, let's face it, you're carrying it. And if you got it with you, I don't consider it cheating or, or fast-tracking a skill set by taking advantage of it to stay above for a shot, right? And so we went through, oh gosh, you know, how you adjust for the different heights. So there's a couple things to take into consideration when you're field shooting. And same thing with PRS. It's about the height that you're shooting from. So consider prone or where we learn our fundamentals of marksmanship. And then as we get further away from the ground, shooting off of rocks and tables and, you know, rooftop simulators, all that, we just keep getting higher into different positions. But then the other thing you have to take into consideration when you're practicing, like the fundamentals of marksmanship, is the angles. And so sometimes you're shooting up against something that's a solid 90 degree or up and down object, like a tree. And there's some little tricks that you can use to do that. And I'll try to post up some stuff. Maybe I'll I'll share with you some of the tricks that we use. And then you've got, you know, branches that are angling from the left and from the right, you know, at 45 degrees. You've got 
uh, different heights and unstable platforms like simulating off of a very round log. How do you get two nice contact points on the bottom of the stock without bringing all this crazy equipment that you see that they're using in different shooting competitions? You know, stuff that I would consider too heavy and too cumbersome and too taxing to take on a huge elk hunt where you're going to be walking around for 10 days in the mountains, right? So I thought this was appropriate to say, look, when you're going on a hunt, it's a little bit different than a match or when you're field shooting. And I think I surprised the guys about we had four or five stages, maybe six that we sat up. And with just simple equipment that you already have, how to take full advantage of it and stable up all these different shots in some of the most simplistic real world scenario ways. And so what I try to tell guys when they're going on hunting trips, and this is sort of what I want to pass along here on the podcast is that by eliminating some of this equipment from your pack, A, you're going to thank yourself later because you're not carrying the stuff around for days and days on end and hoofing it up and down hills. But the other thing is, is you make room for other areas where extra added weight might be a huge benefit. So for example, like in my hunting pack, I've got a very small bag made by Doggone Good. It's, uh, I think it's two by three by four, little block, very light. And then I have a little bit bigger version. It would be like three by four by five. Again, very light, filled with um, almost like shredded plastic. You know, no huge weight issue with it. Um, I have an aluminum set of shooting sticks that are super light. And then I also have, like I said, those straps, uh, my, my bipod. Um, if we're on a hunting trip, we're probably going to take a tripod. So I have a carbon fiber tripod and some attachments that I can shoot from. Uh, but I can also use it for more than that. And I talk about, you know, all the different things you can do with all of these tools in almost all of these weird scenarios to, to just basically take advantage of very simple, real world field tools and stabling up all of these different positions to make shots. And so it was a lot of fun. So we shot from everything from a vertical right wall to uh, round objects that were very unstable to 45-degree angle, um, very wide or unstable objects coming from the left and the right. Uh, we also worked off a rooftop simulator, shooting sticks, tripods, all that great stuff. So in a matter of a couple of hours, we got to do some fantastic training and just really share all kinds of different little things that you can use these for. So that was pretty cool. But I just want to tell guys, you know, Remember when you're packing on these trips or when you're going to a match that more isn't always better. And in, in weight savings in the equipment that you're bringing, maybe you can bring you know a first aid kit, for example, which we really think everybody should have with them. Um, you can um, take some extra water or some food or just, just little things that actually would be a nice comfort item to take along. But on top of that, be really careful. Learn to use what you brought for multiple uses, for multiple things. Don't go out and bring everything that you can. And that's totally two different mindsets. Don't go out and buy every gimmick tool bag that weighs everything from, you know, these a big game changer bag. Like I would not take that on a hunting trip, me personally. I mean, you can, and I'm not faulting you if you do, but for me personally, I leave a lot of that stuff at home. You know, a sling, couple small little bags, a bipod, a tripod, uh, a couple ounce aluminum, you know, shooting sticks, and your backpack. I mean, we we trained on how you can use your backpack for so many different things to stable up a shot and um, in com- combination with your sling, which you already got on your gun, and just train that way. It was awesome. I really enjoyed it, and I, I think they had a great time in all the different stages we sat up and just sharing with them just quick little tricks, but... I was actually pleasantly surprised uh, when I broke out because they asked, hey, could you bring in what you use? And I come in there with this little, my backpack, which is an Everly stock gunslinger two, and just two little bags and a shooting stick. And of course, my tripod's already there. I brought my carbon fiber tripod, which has a spotting scope. And, and they were shocked. They're like, they're expecting to see this, you know, bucket load of equipment and gear and all these other things. And they were, I think, surprised on what little I actually brought and more importantly how many things you could actually use those few things for so when you're out there practicing keep this in mind you'll thank yourself later for the weight but that actually coincides with another thing that i think surprises people a lot of times the weight of my hunting rifle 
So I shoot suppressed. So I have a little bit of a weight with adding the suppressor onto the gun because a really good titanium suppressor is still going to add a pound or so, give or take. I mean, you could add more than that, you know, 18 ounces, 22 ounces, but really you're going to add about a pound just for the suppressor part. But my actual hunting rifle probably is teetering just under 10 pounds. My stock is a little bit heavier than most. It's fully adjustable, A3 and A3-5. I have both. Um, they're painted. I have Weatherby fill, which is not like a sniper fill, but a little bit more denser fill, so it, it adds a little bit weight. It, my one hunting rifle now has the new Bumblebee aluminum action, so it does save seven ounces there, but I also use a little bit heavier contoured carbon fiber barrel. And then my scope itself is a Collis 3 to 18, which weighs nearly two pounds. And so my rifle itself teeters right around that seven pound mark. And until I add the scope and, and then maybe even with the suppressor, I'm actually getting a little bit over 10 pounds. But so I add all of this other stuff to my rifle, you know, we're getting into that area. And I think I stun a lot of people when I tell people that my rifles don't weigh six pounds or four pounds or five pounds. And there's an absolute reason why. And I just want to take a few minutes to share that, you know, you're going to carry all of this equipment. And a lot of these positions adding just one or two pounds of to your rifle makes an absolute world of difference in so many ways for so many different reasons. So light isn't always better. And so I would personally prefer to lose two or three pounds of equipment out of my pack and then put that into my rifle. I'm carrying the same amount of weight, sure, but I've got a little extra added weight to my rifle for a very specific reason. So I just want to go over a couple of scenarios with you here to give you an idea of why this is important. If you take a guy on an average elk hunt, let's just say he's shooting a 300 wind mag, right? And let's just say he built a little bit heavier like mine. So my rifle, I have a 6.5 Creed. I have a 22 Creed now. Um, but let's just say you take a 300 wind mag shooting a 168 class bullet, which is pretty common for a 300 wind mag. And let's say he's, he's launching it out there at a reasonable speed. Now, I'm not talking 3,000 feet or even 2,900 feet per second. I'm talking a reasonable speed for a 300 wind mag. At, at the shooter, you have 19 pounds of recoil. So your 10-pound, 300 wind mag shooting a 168-grain bullet has 19 pounds, 19 foot-pounds of energy putting on your shoulder. Now, that's not taken into consideration the velocity. So you have two types of, of ways that a rifle comes back. It has energy and it has velocity or speed. And so when you look at a rifle like this and you say, okay, hey, we've got you know 19 pounds pounds foot pounds of energy being placed on your shoulder with every shot and then you've got the speed of the rifle coming back and hitting you as well now let's put this in perspective when you start talking about weight of a rifle what if i told you a hunting class rifle and a six pound rifle has as much recoil or energy on the shooter as the 300 wind mag and just a rifle that weighs four pounds more so when you take and you lighten a rifle up to the point to where you're saying, oh, it's featherweight, it's super easy to, to carry, you're hurting yourself by, number one, significantly increasing the felt recoil and velocity on the shooter. So, for example, a 6-pound, six 6.5 six Creedmoor has almost 14 feet per second velocity is coming back and hitting you. That's fast. That's fast. Then you take that rifle with 18 foot-pounds of energy hitting you and jumping and launching. It's actually a lot, and it hurts the shooters in a couple ways. Number one, that 6-pound, six 6.5 six Creedmoor rifle, it's jumping you off target. When you shoot, the rifle's flipping up into the air. It's moving all over the place. It's bouncing off target. And I'll give you an example because I've seen this. Like I watched somebody take a shot at a game animal once with a 300 wind mag and the rifle recoils, comes up in the air, comes down looking somewhere else. And the first question out of their mouths are always this, did I hit it? Because honestly, they don't know. And then if you've got multiple animals out there, the next question usually is, is which one is it? You know, where did it go? Which, which one of the group out there is it? And, and so their mindset, as soon as they pull the trigger, is absolute panic mode because they don't know if they hit the animal and they don't know where it went. 
The same thing happens with a lightweight hunting rifle, even in a 6.5 Creedmoor. It also hurts you a little bit fundamentally with how much it bounces and recoils around from all of these other positions, less stable than prone. So we're talking prone with a bipod before, but now you, you combine that with shooting off a round object like a, a round log or your backpack or rooftop simulator, which is meant to like shooting off of a rock, like going downhill with the rifle. Then all of a sudden the rifle just becomes more unruly and l- more of a handful to handle. If you're going to use your tripod to shoot, which you can, they make a saddleback for on those that you can shoot from your tripod, which is a really stable position. But the heavy recoil's rock in your tripod back, Father. So there's a price to pay. The old saying that ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain, yeah, that works with your backpack. But it's the opposite for your rifle. Ounces and pounds will equal better shots, faster follow-up, better follow-up, better follow-through, and your ability to spot your own shot as the shooter of the rifle. And that, to me, is the most precious thing that I can ask for. Even when I shot a 264 Win Mag, my rifle, fully kitted out, weighed nearly 12 pounds with a Mark IV, 35 by 10 on it. It was a heavyweight, stainless steel barrel, no muzzle brake. It was an aftermarket, thumb-hold stock, That was a little bit on the heavy side. And the reason that rifle was made to that spec was because I could spot my own shot without a muzzle brake. I could get up to that level of caliber, keep the weight of the rifle up a little bit higher, and spot my own shots. I could control the rifle. It's not out of control when I'm shooting. I could see my impacts. That is so huge for shooting. So I just want to share with you real quick some scenarios here. If we take and and add two pounds, just two pounds to that rifle, and we go – and we're talking about a finished rifle with optics now. So this isn't out of line. When you start talking about a six-pound rifle with optics, that is a super, super light rifle. But let's just say we we bump up to an average lightweight rifle, and we can say eight pounds with optics. So let's figure it's in a six-pound mark plus a lightweight scope on it, right? We have taken that down from over 18 foot-pounds of energy – to just over 13 that's a huge savings that's five foot pounds that's a a third that's almost a third just by adding two pounds to the rifle we've reduced the recoil by nearly 33 percent we're still talking about an unsuppressed or unmuzzle braked rifle we've also reduced the velocity from 13.92 to 10.44 again saving almost 30 percent one last step let's say we take that same 6.5 creedmoor and we make it a 10 pound rig fully adjustable stock which adds several ounces to the stock adjustable cheek piece adjustable length of pull we put a real long range scope on it like a collis uh 3 to 18 or a leupold 3 to 18 they're heavier than your traditional scope hunting scopes so the leupold might be 22 to 27 ounces and the collis is about 32 so you've got a rifle that just started life just under eight pounds let's say in a seven pound mark range and then you add your your rings and your scope and your sling and now you're starting to get up close to that 10 pound mark you have reduced a recoil from 18 foot pounds of energy to simply 10.85 that is a huge savings in recoil and taming and calming the rifle down. We've reduced the velocity of the rifle recoiling from 13.92 down to 8.35. Incredible. One last step further. Now, those that know me know that I love to shoot suppressed. I feel bad for the guys that are in states where you can't hunt suppressed or you can't own one. I am under the impression that if if you're on some type of trust, I'm not giving you legal advice here, right? But let's just say you have a, a brother that lives in one state where it's legal and you live in another state where you're not legally allowed to own one. You guys can buy a suppressor together with a trust and it stayed his state at his home and you legally could go and pick it up and take it on your hunt as long as you're on a trust. Now, double check this. I'm not an expert in this law or – Uh, giving you advice on what to do i am told that this is one way that if you live in a state that you're not allowed to have one 
there at your home state that you could actually legally be part owner of one and pick it up on your way on your hunting trip. So really in my mind, and we were talking about this in the class, and these guys were all you know big game hunters as well, that there is nothing like hunting big game suppressed. Number one, if you miss, which I hope you know none of us want to do, but it happens sometimes. If you if you make a bad wind call or something, a lot of times you're not startling the animals. You're not alerting them to that a rifle shot just went off. You're not disturbing everything around you. If you're varmint hunting or hunting coyotes or or shooting, um, let's just say you're, you're wolf hunting, might give you that opportunity to to take the second animal if it's there and present. Or whoever's there with you, if there's if there's a couple elk out there, you shoot one. And then your teammate shoots the other one. You both get a chance to harvest without them taking off and bolting in every direction. But here's the other part. They're hearing safe. So I have a rule with muzzle brakes with hunting rifles is if you cannot promise me that you will put earplugs in, if that animal steps out in front of you at 20 feet or 40 yards and and you get surprised by it, like you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden hear it, the big bull elk just steps right out from behind a tree 40 yards in front of you. Are you going to put your earplugs in or are you just going to shoot? If the answer is you're just going to shoot, then you should never put a muzzle brake on there because you will seriously damage your hearing as well as those that are standing around you. This is a really big deal. I I know friends that have lost hearing over this to where somebody with a muzzle brake right beside them cracked a round off. They didn't have their ears in. It's absolutely brutal. So I am a huge fan of hunting suppressed, huge, huge fan. But let's take the same 10-pound rifle now. 10 pound. And now we throw a suppressor and we say it's got a 35% reduced recoil. So suppressors do work like muzzle brakes that they do reduce recoil. And they also reduce the velocity of the rifle coming back a little bit. So now we've got a 10 pound rifle with a suppressor. So now we've got a much shorter barrel to allow for the suppressor. So we're compensating a little bit weight there. You know, maybe we shave some off the stock, use a carbon fiber painted stock rather than a traditional molded. Maybe we're using the, the new HTN chassis that's coming out, uh, HTN 26 from MDT. But now let's just say we take that same 6.5 Creedmoor with a 140 grain bullet that at six pounds was recoiling like a 300 wind mag, right? It now goes from 18 pounds, 18.08 foot pounds of energy at six pounds to 8.49 you've by adding just simply four pounds to the rifle going from six pounds to ten pounds and adding a suppressor you have reduced your felt recoil by nearly 60 percent 70 percent you're reducing it by almost 10 that's huge My point is, is when I shared my hunting rifle and I talked a little bit about it and I showed my stock, I think I got a look like, wow, this is sort of a little heavier than I thought it would be. And and yeah, it is. And some guys, you know, say that, hey, I don't want to lug that around on the mountain. And I'll be honest with you, I don't. I mean, I, I carry it. But if I'm walking up and down steep terrain or if I'm just going to a different location, I'll slip my rifle in my backpack. With the Gunslinger 2, you can set your rifle right between your shoulders, and you're not only carrying it on your shoulders with the rest of your backpack equipment, but you also have a waist belt that's carrying some of it or load-bearing on your hips. It is nothing like carrying a 10-pound rifle in your hands for 8 or 10 hours. You're giving yourself a really nice break. The rifle's not bouncing all over the place or the sling slipping it upside down and bouncing off the rocks. You can, you can easily reach in and pull it straight out to use it. So it's not like it's an issue to where it's hidden away and you've got to unpack it for five minutes to get to it. That's not it at all either. But the beauty part of it is, is that when you're ready to shoot as a shooter, you can spot your own shot. So when I put that rifle in my pack, yeah, I'm not sliding a six pound rifle in there. I might be sliding a 10 pound rifle in there. But I've also reduced a lot of the other equipment that a lot of people do take to compensate for that four pounds. So in essence, I'm carrying the same weight. It's just I put a little bit more of the weight into the gun and 100% on purpose. So when you're thinking about getting your, your rifle kit together or you're thinking about getting all of this, don't fall into that mindset or that trick that I've got to build the lightest rifle on the planet. Because there is a price to pay. 
And that comes at the expense of spotting and self-spotting, super fast follow-up shots, all of these other things you are sacrificing for that. And of course, the bigger the caliber, when you start getting into like, let's just say the 280 Ackley, which we're getting ready to, to start working with here, that's a 7mm based caliber, really mild recoil, much less than a 30 odd six, of course. But still, if you build that in a six pound gun, it feels like a 300 wind mag shooting a 200 grain bullet. And so you sort of cut your feet out from underneath yourself by going super light, even though you're going smaller in caliber, it's still uncomfortable to shoot. Most kids, now, you know, here's another thing to think about. Most kids get light rifles because the parents don't want them to carry this big, heavy thing around, right? And I get that, right? I had a 12-year-old uh, that I took hunting, right? But the thing of it is, is when they're shooting it, they're not going to enjoy it as much. The recoil is going to be there. My daughter's rifle was a little bit heavier barrel, 223. Suppressed, it was incredible to shoot. It was super stable for her to shoot off of shooting sticks or anything else she wanted to shoot it off of. At 12 years old, the rifle didn't go anywhere. But had I built that same rifle in a six-pound rifle with you know no suppressor or anything like that on it, it's going to bounce around a little bit. It's going to move around a little bit. They're not quite as stable with it. They're not watching their own shots, hitting the steel and, and shooting paper and all that good stuff. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you can trade one weight for another, which is bad weight, right? You're shedding weight out of your backpack. The old ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain. But then you get to add that weight somewhere else to where you're actually taking pain away. You're just trading it for what would be bad weight to good weight. And you're carrying the same amount. So I hope it makes sense. I hope it comes off that it, it sort of clicks a little bit with some of you guys out there. And feel free to comment. You know, we'll post up uh, on our Facebook page here shortly. You know, you can post up a picture of your hunting rifle. We'd like to see what you have and, and talk about weights. But this is just, you know, my experience from the shooting school. We just finished one up yesterday and broke out some equipment and, of course, talked about the stocks and all the other things, you know, where, yeah, I'm shooting a lighter action but a little bit heavier barrel and carbon fiber. And, yeah, I'm shooting a two-pound scope. And, yes, my stock is a little bit heavier than a traditional hunting stock you might or the weight you might think it should be. But in the end, the combination of that plus my suppressor means I can sit there and shoot that rifle all day. I certainly can comfortably carry it on a sling or on my shoulder. It's, it's no big deal. Uh, but when I throw it in my pack, my pack weighs the same as if I would have taken all this other unnecessary equipment that you see people carry on a hunt and uh, will seldom use or use properly. So I can take these other things that that work well for multiple positions, very minimalistic, but super useful. So I'm just telling you, is you get a couple of really nice little bags, learn to use everything that you bring to stabilize your shot. Like you have all of this stuff. And a lot of people just don't take full advantage of what they brought, but don't bring what you can when you're going on a hunt. Don't think of every little tool and gadget and gadgets that you can throw in your backpack, and you'll thank yourself on that weight and then transfer that to your rifle and enjoy your rifle that much more. So I hope that makes sense, and I do want to say a quick thanks to MDT. MDT is a proud sponsor of the podcast here, and I just want to throw out that we've got a bunch of their stocks here on our wall. You are more than welcome to come in and see us and check out all the different lines. We have the LSS, we have the ESS, we have the ACC, we have the Orcs on the wall, we have the new HTN coming, we have the XRS, and so you can come in, check out the stocks. It's no charge to you. We'd love to have you stop by and say hi. Uh, we can throw a barreled action in it, and you can we can go back in our classroom. We can throw them out on the floor, and you can jump on a rifle prone and see how it fits you and, and check out the fitment. And we're in Somerset, PA, so we're about dead center in the middle of the third of the population of the entire United States, and we're within driving distance of about a third of the population of the United States. We'd love to have you. Our hours will be posted up soon, so you can just check out our hours or you can call in advance here at the shop and we'll make sure that we're here or someone's here when you plan on stopping by but i'd love to have you but i do want to say thank you to mdt they sent us a whole bunch of stocks for on our wall and so that customers can have a place at least here in pennsylvania they can come and check out all of these awesome stocks and actually get a chance to uh to touch them and feel them and play with them and if you come in for our open range days or classes uh, that we teach for our 101 custom rifle building class we'll actually take you to range and let you shoot them uh, so we'll have some of them there that you can actually take to our local range under some instruction and we'll actually get you some rounds down range with the stocks themselves. So thank you, MDT. You can stop over and see all the great stuff they have going on. It's MDTTAC.com. That's MDTTAC.com. Now, just a quick update, though. I want to tell you that my personal hunting rifle is going to be a 22 Creedmoor. 
and we are super, super excited about it. So the guys that come through were shooters for sure. And they were shocked that even a 75 grain air was 5.4 mils to 1,000 yards and hammers. So they were scary accurate at 100 yards and hammering at 1,000. We were shooting a 6.5 by 47 and 6.5 Creed as well. And there was no advantage to the other calibers over to 22 Creed. It was absolutely stunning to watch. Now, when we combine that with the new 88 grain and 90 grain A tips, uh, that are coming out, so the 88 grain ELD match and the 90 grain A tip. So they actually decimate the other calibers as far as uh, ballistics wise. It's amazing to see and shoot. These guys were stunned. They were sending texts and pictures to to other people that they know, saying, "Have you heard anything about this caliber? Are you guys shooting this and checking this out?" I mean, that was really cool. But here's the thing: my God, there's no recoil. And so if you think about like you take a 6.5 Creed at 10 pounds and you've got eight foot pounds of energy coming back under recoil, you, you make that a 77 or 80 grain solid coming out of a 22 Creed more and even an eight or 10 pound rifle. Now you're down to four and five. It's absolutely incredible. The rifle doesn't move. So scary fast follow up shots. You can literally watch your own bullet rise and fall and hit the target, which is incredible for a hunting rifle. So I'm super excited. I'm building mine as we speak. It's going to be a 19-inch international barreled hunting rifle with the new Bat Bumblebee Aluminum Action and a McMillan A3-5. As I'm getting it together, I'll send you some pictures of it. Uh, my barrel is in the works as we speak, so can't wait. I'm like a little kid at Christmas. I haven't built myself a new rifle in a long time. Uh, so I'm excited to get it together and get it to the range. So I'll post some pictures up when she's all put together and at the range. I'm super excited. Can't wait to get her here. So I hope you all enjoyed the show. Uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us here on the podcast and for all your support. If you'd like any information on Wolf Precision, you can stop over to wolfprecision.net. That's wolfprecision.net, where we offer lots of great classes in both the long-range shooting school and reloading and custom rifle building, as well as a lot of different rifle components that you can purchase through us. You're also more than welcome to stop over to Facebook. We have a Facebook page as well. Uh, leave any comments. Love to hear from you. Uh, shoot us an email. It's contact at wolfprecision.net. If you have any questions or things that you would like us to address on the show, uh, if we address your questions here or answer your question here on the podcast, we will send you a hat or a t-shirt as our way of saying thank you. So my name is Jamie Dotson. I'm your host, and you're listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. Uh-huh.